All right, this is my sermon as of now for July 13th, 2014. The readings for this Sunday is Isaiah 55, 1 through 5, and Matthew 14, verses 13 to 21, or it's reverse 13, verse 14 to 21. But it is Jesus feeds the 5,000. Just so you know, I'm doing this on an iPad. My laptop is not functioning uh, in terms of video, so there will be a lot of back and forth like that. Okay. What does peace mean to you? Think about it. Is it the neighborhood you decided to raise your children in? Or maybe it's the job you don't really love, but provides great benefits and economic stability. Peace for you could be the ability to look at the horizon and know bombs won't go off in the distance. It could even be the simple fact that you don't have to worry about where your next meal's coming from. Many of us, God has blessed with these gifts of peace. We live in communities where there is not war surrounding us and physical violence is not intruding in our personal spheres. We have civil liberties that allow us to voice our opinions, petition injustices, and are provided with the basic needs of survival if we cannot do so ourselves. Above all, we get to experience true peace. Our country allows us to organize and to protest, to get an education and to be literate, to unite as one and advocate for what we need as a society and to be empathetic and loving towards our neighbors. But I dare to ask, how often do we take this peace for granted? Growing up, my mother would always say, no sleep for mother hen until her chickadees are in the den. Knowing we were all safe and sound brought a world of peace to her that I cannot even describe. For my siblings and I, we always seem to laugh and brush it off. This is the 2000s. What could possibly happen to us after 1 a.m. on a Friday night in New York? But that is not the point. She was not concerned with the fact that almost every time we were out, we answered her dozens of text messages and came home without a scratch on our bodies. To her, it is about the peace she gains, knowing that those she loves are being cared for and are safe. We are her flock, her kin, her babies. In many ways, her lifeline. She carried us for 63 months collectively, mothered us for almost 34 years, and will continue to be there, I think even through our end. To lose the kind of peace would be a devastating act of violence, one no mother should endure. God gives us instructions of peace building in Isaiah as she asks us to come and quench our thirst, to consume something greater than worldly items or objects that will never satisfy our spiritual hunger. Come, all you who are thirsty. A human can go over a week without food before their body starts to break down. I don't believe any person should starve, but it is something our bodies can endure if necessary. But we can only go three, maybe four days without water. Metaphorically speaking, it only makes sense that our creator's gift of faith comes as a liquid. Imagine how the Hebrews must have felt receiving this message. For years, they have experienced all types of violence. Physical brutality from the Egyptians. The institutional violence of slavery economic disparity as a lower caste, and cultural violence due to their religious beliefs. After generations of being an oppressed and misplaced group, God offers them a covenant, a peace treaty, a promise to show empathy upon them. She welcomes the Hebrews in with the feast only the spirit can love. 
nourishment for broken souls and tired feet. But this is not a stagnant love. No, God asked her children through this peace offering to be like David, a commander and leader of nations. You see, David was a witness, an activist, if you must, to God's power. Follow her and also be a witness to her good works. Right here, she is laying down the basic plan for humankind. If we are to live in a peaceful world, we need to emulate the peace God puts in our life and pay it forward to another being. Stewardship, to take ownership in what God has provided and ask us to be caretakers for. Lema Gabawi is a well-known Lutheran social worker and peacemaker from Liberia. After years of suffering during the Liberian Civil War, she made strives to better herself and her community. When the war had finally ended and years of praying, demonstrating, organizing finally slowed down, the first democratic election in years had arrived. And the question came up, what's next? Finally, conflict had been resolved in her homeland. There was no more violence, and the political injustice was coming to a halt. So where does Gabawi and her team go from here? The answer? Keep going. She said peace is a process, not an event. To further expand on this, let's think of the text. God tells the Hebrew to go to foreign nations. Now they may not know you, but they will come running to you and join you. There's this LeBron James commercial where he leaves his house and starts running down the block. And people just kind of stop and drop what they're doing and they follow behind him. There's this girl, you know, running in a dress, some guy on his bike, someone drops their tools. I think someone just grabbed their baby and started going. <laughs> the point is they all gravitate to him. Now say what you want about LeBron. I feel similar. But they, yes. Okay. Bye. Bye. They came to the Miami Heat. Uh, he came to the Miami Heat, put the team on his back, and is recognized as the best player in the NBA. He got the message. A leader and commander. Do you? This scripture was written thousands of years ago, but applies directly to us today. Right now, you're sitting in a Lutheran church and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America in the most active faith has organized social services both domestically and globally. The care and concern for our neighbors is one of the most important aspects in our doctrine. Here at St. Peter's, we've established the Stevens Ministry, a collection of laypersons called to help care for another member in need, a social ministry focusing on several different community-related services that we contribute to, youth and family ministries, Christian education ministries, multiple music ministries, and a series of other outreaches that function through the church. Think about that. These are fairly autonomous groups functioning through the same ownership mentioned earlier, stewardship. It is because all of you that the church is able to serve its community in the way that it does. But let's take this even further. How can St. Peter's go the extra mile with our commitment to our neighbors? I wanna to talk to you about a type of violence we do not always see in the United States. This is not about war or terrorism. It is not directly about politics or corruption. This is about the health and social welfare of our neighbors. In various parts of the world, malaria is the leading cause of death. Zambia is one of these areas, and they average more than 4 million cases per year. Because of this disease, the people of Malawi are accustomed to their children not making it past five years old. Families of Angola, Burundi, Liberia, Nigeria, Tanzania, Uganda, and Zimbabwe have similar experiences to the disease. In 2012 alone, 
There were 207 million cases worldwide. 165.6 million of those cases were in Africa. 149 million ended in death. Out of that death rate, 126.7 million of those deaths were children under five years old. This is the violence that I speak of because this is certainly not peace. A mosquito, a tiny mosquito can carry a parasite that will devastate communities for generations and somehow we have not managed to stop it? The death of over 126 million children is an act of violence. It is violent because we are aware and many of us choose to remain neutral to the fact. It is violent in the sense that we have the monetary means to provide treatment, prevention, education, health providers, and materials to protect the people in 13 African countries that we sponsor and we're still lacking. It is violent because malaria is commonly associated with poverty and the majority of those who can afford malaria will never have to experience it to truly understand how tragic it is to bury your children deeper than their own age. That is violence. A Lutheran pastor in Mozambique, Reverend Eduardo Sinalo, and his congregation decided to take action against the virus. They took two days with 34 leaders and learned everything they could about the disease. They learned how it was transmitted, how to prevent infection, how to and when to seek treatment. In addition, they learned how to pass along this information and provided nets for pregnant women and mothers with small children. Two years later, the ELCA got involved and created their malaria campaign, which is currently in the process of raising money and awareness today. Be like David, a commander and leader of nations. Let us take ownership in the quality of life of our neighbor's experience. Take ownership in the care their governments, health organizations, religious institutions give them. Take ownership in the role we too have played in many of the predicaments they are in. When we act as a neutral body in conflict, we are not removing ourselves from the situation, but giving power to the oppressor. But how can we give power to mosquitoes, you may be thinking. And that, brothers and sisters, is where we are wrong. It is so far beyond that. We give power to the drug companies that will not lower the price of medication for those that need it. Power to corrupt governments that rather drive Range Rovers than provide proper living conditions for their people. When we choose to be neutral to a, violent, a virus that only affects impoverished nations, we are giving power to the capitalists that abuse these regions and take no responsibility in the advancement of the people that live there. American theologian Walter Wink once said, neutrality in a situation of oppression always supports the status quo. Church, are you still awake? There is no room for a truce. Do you hear the message yet? It is not the job of the church to calm the tides. We are called to make waves. There should not be any still water available for mosquitoes to thrive because we should be shaking the water. And this is where we fall as a body in Christ. It is good that we are aware, but do not be too aware. Let them march in the streets begging for aid, but do not march with them. No, speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. Proverbs 31. For any of you that watch Orange is the New Black, there's an episode in the second se season that focuses on this mature nun. Now, for most of the entire series, you don't see much of her, really know her story, aside from the fact that she was incarcerated for some sort of political protest. Finally, the show flashes back into her life as a young nun just entering the ministry, and a few of her nun friends convince her to head out and protest Vietnam. At first, the young version of the imprisoned nun was reluctant to go with the reservation that the Catholic Church and the head nun would look down upon her decision, that they would reprimand her. Her friend, though, insists that they had the approval of the church and that they, as Christians, were called to protest an unjust war. 
her nun friend said to her, speak out, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. So they went off to protest with the others against the Vietnam War. And she was hooked. The imprisoned nun like us was caught up in the mistaken identity of the proper church role. She feared disobeying clergy and other representatives of the church rather than serving God the way she intended, as a peace builder. But once she got her feet wet, this lifestyle became the only one she knew. And in her eyes, a prison sentence was worth the well-being of her neighbors. So where does Christ come into all of this? What does Jesus have to say about neutrality? about stewardship, about peace. He says, do it yourselves. I want you to understand what's happening in the Gospel of Matthew to truly comprehend how committed Christ was to his neighbors. You see, prior to the story, Jesus was just back in Nazareth, the town he grew up in. He was like a stranger walking into a Lutheran church and sitting in the back row in the seat of that one parishioner whose great-grandfather laid the founding bricks to the building, you don't sit there. You don't belong. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200, Jesus. And if that wasn't hard enough to accept, Jesus' best friend, John the Baptist, was murdered for political disobedience. Mm. If anyone knows about a rough day, it's Christ. So Jesus is walking through townships aching. He's trying so hard to find a place to himself to be in solitude, but he has more than just a shadow following him. I think a lot of older parents can relate to this experience. You sit at work all day trying to balance your checkbook, answering your children's phone calls and negotiating family drama. You come home and no one did the dishes. No one has touched the laundry in a week. Dinner hasn't been cooked, and your kids don't even acknowledge that you've been home for almost 20 minutes, and then out of nowhere, you get bombarded with, I need to get a ride to practice. Can I get money for the movies? I need my shirt ironed for the concert tonight. Can I take the car to the mall? Am I kind of accurate there? Not only do you have the duties of maintaining an actual job and managing your personal life, you also have the needs of your children to think about. As much as... We believe that it would be satisfying to lock yourself in the room and watch reruns of your favorite talk shows while the kids are running around until they pass out from a sugar high on top of the coffee table. That's not always the path we choose. With thousands of people following Jesus on land, instead of retreating from those who seek him, he takes pity. We as children of faith at times are unable to grasp the concept that not everything's about us. It tends to be me, me, me when we pray. Help me, guide me, strengthen me, save me, give me. But God doesn't say to her kid, guide yourself to salvation, save yourselves from sin. No. God hears our prayers and says, yes, yes, yes. And be like David in return. In an empathetic state, Christ is practicing miracles again. The disciples are there watching and finally saying, it's already very late and this is a lonely place. Send the people away and let them go to the villages to buy food for themselves. Imagine for a second being in the first century Israel in your cheapest pair of sandals. Ugh. Now imagine walking for miles on unpaved road in the sun with your basic necessities. You have nothing. Now, I don't want you for a second to think that the early Christians had any type of money. Those who followed Christ were not wealthy folk. Remember, he ministered to the poor, the handicapped, prostitutes, and children. If you followed Christ, you were more likely to be drowning under the poverty line than anything else. You know that Bon Jovi song, Living on a Prayer? Oh, we're halfway there. Yeah, he wrote that for the Hebrews. <laughs> they were living on a prayer. 